The Oklahoma City Thunder own the NBA title belt after beating the Orlando Magic. We'll talk about that and why SGA proved he's a playoff player coming up. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and beat writer for InsideTheThunder.com, Ryland Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LOThunderPod. Email the show, LOThunderPod at gmail.com. On today's show, we're diving into the Oklahoma City Thunder beating the Orlando Magic on national television. What does this mean and what did this show for Oklahoma City? Why this game was so, you know, indicative of what this team could do in the postseason. And of course, the Thunder have the title belt, baby. They beat the Sacramento Kings. They beat the Orlando Magic. And now they'll head into the All-Star break in control of the belt. Check out John Corrales. Check out uh, Locked On Celtics. They do a great job keeping up with the belt, which is now the Locked On NBA Championship belt. So at the start of the year, The reigning champ has it, and then each time that they get beat, of course, it changes hands. And it changes hands again and again and again. And eventually, the rabbit hole fell all the way down to where Sacramento had it. The Thunder beat them, and they keep it now after beating Orlando. So a lot of fun there. But let's talk about this game against the Orlando Magic. So despite Orlando having one of the best theme songs in the NBA, Orlando Magic, Orlando Magic, Orlando Magic, oh, 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 the Thunder won, 127 to 113 on TNT on Shaq's Jersey retirement night. So another massive game spoiled by the Thunder. And this game, I think, showed why the Thunder, despite their age, uh, you know, have players who are, you know, big game players and who are players who can play in a playoff environment. Now, you know, this is the magic team that is, that is a young up and coming team. They're still, you know, growing. And and this is not going to be a game in which, uh, as a whole, you look back on and say that, you know, because you could beat the Magic on the road, you're a contender. But it's it's the pathway to get to a win like this that makes, you know, it translatable a little bit to how postseason basketball is played. Only four lead changes. The Thunder once led by 21 points. Uh, the Magic once led by 11 points and collapsed that lead. You know, what was so good about this game is that the Thunder made adjustments within the course of it. and. The Thunder kind of had the best of both worlds unfold. So at the beginning of the game, whenever SGA is struggling and and not playing to his, you know, peak ability, and at halftime he had eight points. Like, that is not a good SGA game. That is not what you expect from SGA, who's, who's, you know, the leader in the clubhouse for the MVP award, in my opinion, and, you know, an all-star starter and everything else. You only got eight points from him in the first half. And yet you still went into intermission up by 10. Because, number one, You have to give a huge shout out to what that bench was able to provide. You got a game in which your complementary pieces were able to carry the load and were able to uh, not only keep the the ship afloat, but were able to help you maximize on runs. When you have a team like that, that when your number one best player is taken out of the game, so to say, but yet it doesn't sink you, you have a really good basketball team, especially in such a star-driven league. And so you have to give a lot of credit to what the Thunder were able to do off the bench and, and how the Thunder bench players were able to score. Isaiah Joe had 10 points. Jay Will, a couple massive threes. Cason Wallace had eight points. You know, Wiggins had five. Jang had two. Like, like the bench was able to score. And there's only so much you can do to maintain SGA. He had eight points in the first half. He finishes with 32. So, yes, the bench was was great at at holding over the Thunder. And still, as much as they struggled in the first half, they they went into the halftime break with with a cushion of a lead. And then you had SGA turn it on. And then you also see that you not have just one player who can hit tough shots down the stretch, but two. A lot of teams don't have one. 
So when you look at SGA first, let's talk about him. SGA in this game, why he proved that this was a translatable postseason game is because there's been a lot of talk about the lack of experience, a lot of talk about what would, what would SGA do um, you know, come playoff time, never played in the playoff series as this iteration of himself. And that's true. You know, you look back at his career. He did play in the playoff series against the Warriors where he played really well, uh, you know, on, on the floor for the Clippers with Doc Rivers and played in the raucous environment and, and was tested in that way and stood up to that test very well. But again, he was not the guy or even close to the guy. Going in the bubble, you can auto automatically put an asterisk on the, that playoff series because it was the bubble. But he still was not the guy and was not in this role where you're where you're taxing him to this extreme. So this will be, for all intents and purposes, his first playoff series in the aggregate of what you're looking for him to do. And so there's been a lot of questions of if, you know, what we're seeing the last couple of regular seasons can translate to that point. I think that at each turn, he's done a good job of putting that narrative to bed, but especially in this game against Orlando. You know, it was a frustrating game. You know, you got to give credit to Jalen Suggs and to the rest of the Magic. They played very aggressive defense. And then also shots weren't falling that, you know, typically go in for SGA in the first half. He takes that. He uses that aggressive defense from Orlando against the Magic to get to his spots and to score the basketball in the second half. And then lets out all that emotion whenever he told Magic fans to go home and, uh, and, and was able to put an exclamation point on this win. But... The in-game adjustments is the difference in the postseason. The in-game adjustments and game-to-game -game adjustments are the difference. It is a seven-game sprint, whereas an 82-game marathon is what we're happening right now. And in those seven games, it is entirely externally focused. You know, for the last couple of years, we've been talking to Mark about uh, and, and trying to get quotes from him about you know game plans and about how do you prepare for so-and-so star or so-and-so team. And at each turn, he continues to remind that in the regular season, a lot of your preparation is internally. A lot of your preparation is what can we do better? Because if you spend all your resources on the limited practices that you have in the regular season, on the limited time that you have to prepare for each game, because they happen so fast in the regular season, you know, you're kind of turning your wheels, in my opinion, because you're not going to play that team, you know, in some cases for the rest of the year, like, like in the case of last night's Magic game, or for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. So, you know, you are spending most of your time right now looking internally and looking at how you can get better against zone just generically, how you can get better, uh, you know, as a, as a rhythm team. In the postseason, you not only have more days off than you typically do, but you're entirely looking to take them away, take the opponent away and match up with that opponent seven times in a row. If the series goes to the maximum games, so is the other team though. And so whoever can combat the counters from the other team, the best is going to win that series. The Thunder are going to have a fighting shot in any series that they play this postseason, And the difference is going to be how Mark adjusts, how Shea adjusts, how Jada adjusts, how Chet adjusts to the focus and the scouting report were there at the top, where they're the guy to take to get taken away. And when you see a game like this where Shea just doesn't have it, and then you can literally see a, a transition in the way he's playing from the first half to the second half, not just the results, the process of how he was attacking the magic changed within that you know 10-minute intermission. That is what should give you a ton of confidence in this Thunder team in the postseason and in that player specifically in SGA. Another way that you should you know, grow confidence from this game is the fact that you have two guys who no team wants to face at the end of games. And most playoff games are going to come down to the wire. Most playoff games are driven by guys making a, a, incredible plays. You have two that can do that. Let's talk about J-Dub coming up. But first, I want to tell you right now, but good friends, over at Hungry Root. Check them out today. That's HungryRoot.com slash locked on to get 40% off of your first delivery and get your free veggies. Check them out today because Hungry Root is great. So whenever you go to Hungry Root, the, the, the beautiful thing is, 
It can help you uh, with you know, healthy living. Uh, and it's the easiest way to make fresh, high quality groceries and get them simple. Uh, healthy recipes are delivered right to your door. And so all the benefits it gives you, first of all, of course, the, the healthy options it gives you uh, for eating wise, but you also can save money with Hungry Root because you know, you're not going to the grocery store, uh, you're eating out less and, and you're avoiding that expensive takeout in restaurants as well. You're also going to reduce food waste because Hungry Root can save you 30% on food waste each week. And you're going to get that special discount code for 40% off your first order and free veggies for life. And so with Hungry Root, you just take a fun, short quiz and Hungry Root will know your personal health goals, what you like to eat, and the kitchen appliances that you use and have. That way they can send you recipes that are tailor-made to what you're trying to do personally. So Hungry Root is there for you. They recommend uh, you know, that, that you check them out today because they can get you those recipes uh, and have you fly in no time. Uh, everything from Hungry Root follows a simple standard. It's got to taste good. It's got to be quick to make. And it's got to contain whole uh, ingredients uh, that are there for you uh, with whole trusted ingredients. So check them out today. It's uh, an ability for you to save hours of planning, shopping, and cooking. Hungry Root delivers food that you're going to love. Right now, Hungry Root is offering Locked on Thunder listeners 40% off your first delivery uh, and free veggies for life by going to HungryRoot.com slash locked on. That's HungryRoot.com slash locked on for 40% off your first delivery and get your free veggies there as well. Oh, Orlando Magic. I know that they didn't win the game, but I still can't get that on my head. But st- the second best theme song, by the way, not the first. It, it, it's it's the popular pick right now. They've done a great job, the Magic app, of promoting this, this theme song on TikTok. Great job. Great marketing. Great TikTok. The very best NBA theme song is the Philadelphia 76ers. Clap your hands, everybody. For Philadelphia, 76ers, stomp your feet, everybody. For Philadelphia, 76ers, here they come. Philadelphia, on the run, team of the year. Number one, Philadelphia, on the run, stand up and cheer. One, two, three, four, five, sixers. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 76ers. Now. Check out that song. Check out the Magic song. If you want a non-NBA song, Miami Dolphins have the best. The original Miami Dolphins um, fight song is the best as well. We, we Locked on fight songs coming soon. But let's continue talking about this game against Orlando. So whenever you, um, whenever you look at this game, we talked about SGA and how he was able to make the adjustments. Let's talk Jalen Williams. Jalen Williams in this game scored 33 points. It's his first ever stretch where he has two consecutive games of 30 plus points in a single game, three assists, two rebounds and a steal while shooting 66% from the floor and 50% from three, six of seven from the free throw line. He's getting to the free throw line more. He's shooting the ball and scoring efficiently at all three levels. And he's improved defensively. Now I was a big proponent of his defense last year. Uh, because it was easy to see. It was easy to see how you know translatable it would be uh, and, and developmental, you know, great developably. What am I trying to say? Developmental, developmentally, it could develop into being a really good defender. Uh, could could J Dub, and he has, uh, and he's been very versatile and switchable for the Thunder defense, which ranks uh, you know in the top five of the NBA. And that's been a large part due to everybody, but but J Dub has been really good in that category as well. So he's. Already a rising star as a two-way player on both ends of the floor. He's already one of the most efficient three-level scores that the league has. He's been one of the best, you know, fourth quarter players, especially since the turn of the new year um, in the fourth quarter for OKC. Jalen Williams is just fantastic. And Jalen Williams just has that, that it factor about him, especially down the stretch of games. And, he can go create a shot. You know, I think that the, the the biggest conversation for this team, dating back to last year, dating back to the, the summertime, dating back to, you know, preseason, was who can go get a bucket? Whenever they take away SGA and double SGA, who in the postseason, when the game is bogged down, when the game's in the half court, when the game is um, kind of 
in a weird situation flow wise, because the game is very much less flowy uh, in the postseason. Who's going to go hit the tough shot? Who's going to go generate their own luck? And, you know, last year the question was, can Jada do that? Because he's a naturally more, um, you know, passive player is the wrong way to say it because that has a negative connotation. But he very much, last year especially, plays through the flow of the game and wants to make the right basketball decision. And we talked about this this time last year, where sometimes the right basketball decision is a good J-Dub shot versus a great shot from somebody else or a, a, a good SGA shot versus a great shot from somebody else. And Mark talked about that where, you know, he, his analogy was great about this, the number line. If you imagine a number line, some players are naturally more, um, you know, passive or go with the flow. Some players are naturally way more aggressive. You want to get everyone as close to the middle of that scale as you can. And he used J-Dub as an example of being a more naturally passive player and use Lou Dort as being a more naturally over-aggressive player. And when he made that analogy last year, you look at it this year and what's happened. Jalen Williams has gotten way, way, way closer to the middle, if not exceeded into um, an aggressive player, which you love to see. And Lou Dort has gotten way, way closer to the middle and has made better decisions um, as, as being a more passive player. Still, it's not perfect from Lou Dort, but you cannot deny that this year he's made more efficient decisions. He's made better um, choices with a shot selection, and he's kept the offense in flow way more than he has previously. Something, again, that we talked about last year would happen this year with better players coming around him to push him down that totem pole. Actually, I think it's up the totem pole because I think that technically on a totem pole, the, the lowest one is the most important one. I think I've read one time. I don't read very much, so I could be wrong. But still, J-Dub going out there and hitting tough shots night after night and getting this bigger and bigger and bigger sample size. I don't care how young they are. You know, they have proven to be an anomaly to this point. The playoff is a different animal. But you look around the NBA. You look around the Western Conference. Who would you rather take if it's a star-driven league? Who would you rather have duo-wise on the same team than SGA and J-Dub? Not to mention, we haven't talked about Chet Holmgren yet. We haven't talked about uh, you know th th their complimentary cast yet, which is still uh, one of the best in the West. The teams that you you know would argue has a has a has an opportunity to be better than those two guys or who you might take this year because of experience and because of um, what they've proven already, you're not going to meet those teams until round two. You might not meet that team until the conference finals. So it's like the Thunder might have the inside lane to, to be a contender out West. We talked about this on tomorrow's show, which you're going to hear um, with me and Michael Martin at midnight on, on going into Thursday. It'll be Thursday's show. Um, but the expectations have changed this year for the Thunder. I don't want it to get too crazy. I think that still a good season is a six or seven game playoff series. But when you look at it right now, and what I think is going to happen is I think that the Thunder will have, you know, home court in the West. I'm not going to say that they're going to be the first seed because it's a razor thin edge. But the difference in the four and five seed for these teams that are clumped up at number one is five games. I don't foresee this young Thunder team giving those five games back. I think this young Thunder team at worst is going to be seed number four. At best could be the top seed. You know, like anything can happen in that range right there. But you're going to have a home court series. You're going to have SGA and you're going to have Jalen Williams. You're going to have Chet Holmgren. You're going to have all these guys. And you have to feel good about it. Once you get into the dance, anything can happen. I, and I, I just still don't think that these guys will just forget how to play basketball in April. Uh, Lou Dort, got to give him a lot of credit. Uh, he knocked down some shots in this one, two for four from three, uh, scored eight points, but was really physical defensively with Paolo Benicaro uh, and, and played well on both ends of the floor with two steals and four assists. Josh Giddy, this is exactly why we highlighted him against Sacramento. His box score against Sacramento didn't look like this, but the process looked like this. And so the process has been right now for two straight games for Josh Giddy. Two games is a small sample size. It's not going to undo what we've seen for the majority of this season. But this is why we take the time to talk about these things, even in games where it's not the flashy, sexy box score. 
because he was cutting more and screening more and playing more off ball in an engaged active role against Sacramento. You can go back and listen to that recap podcast. And that's exactly what he did against the magic, you know, five for eight from, you know, the floor. Listen to this though. You take away those three missed threes. He was over three from three and he was perfect inside the arc. And it's, by far resounding one of his most efficient games is that it's exactly what we've been saying since August, that the swing for Josh Giddy is not three-point shooting. The swing for Josh Giddy is scoring inside the arc. We've been saying that since August as he was working on his mid-range game for Team Australia and showing more of his mid-range game for Team Australia because he's never going to shoot the ball enough from three to make that intrinsically valuable to where the defense will shift over to him and defend him. He can shoot 40% from three. He'll look like Jay Will did last year shooting the same number. But if he can score efficiently inside the arc, he's going to be an efficient player. And it opens up so much more for him like it did against Orlando where he puts up 10, 5, and 5. And so I get it. You're, 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 you're going to hold the larger sample size against him. But this is two straight games where he's been put in a better role for him. And if that continues, which there's no reason to believe it, it won't, I guess, besides the, the, the first half of this year. Uh, but if these latest trends of him being more engaged versus having to camp out in the corner for three offensively hold up, I think that you'll see a turn in Josh Giddy's season. And the thing that the Thunder have done is even if you, that turn never comes, they've gotten help. They, they It's going to come with, you know, Gordon Hayward. It's going to come with playing case and more. It's going to come with other aspects of it. But looking at Josh Key specifically, this is back-to-back -back games where I think the process was really good. Of course, no one's going to argue the box score or, or clanking the, the three at the backboard against Sacramento was good. But we argued on, the, on this show yesterday uh, that it was actually a good game, that it was actually um, a, a good process for him. So it was good to see him get rewarded with stats in this one um, for, for you know the, the process he had against Sacramento. Now, coming up, Let's talk about this Thunder team heading into the All-Star break uh, and more. But first, once say right now, we good friends over at eBay Motors. Check them out today at eBay Motors. They're great. They want to keep your ride or die alive. Passion, drive, and patience. That's what brings home the winning trophy. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. Check them out today at eBay Motors. They have everything you need to maintenance your vehicles, and level up your peak performance from superchargers to roof racks to exhaust kits to LED headlights and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has exactly what you need. With over 122 million parts to choose from, your number one ride or die, check them out today to find exactly what you're looking for. And that's the eBay Guaranteed Fit. It's your guaranteed fit to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you are burning rubber, not cash. So with your parts today, you can go check them out to keep your ride, ride or die alive at eBay Motors. Eligible items only and exclusions to apply. The eBay Motors guaranteed fit is only available for U.S. customers. But with all the parts that you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win with the eBay Motors guaranteed fit. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. We've got the NBA Lockdown title belt in Oklahoma City. Heading to Indiana. I'm heading to Indiana. Indiana, here I come. There should be a song like that about Indiana. There might be. Hoosiers don't come for me. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to pass through Kansas City, but who knows? Maybe I will. Going to Kansas City. Now, this game against this has been a very much a singing show. I do apologize for that. Uh, that was that's pretty awful of me. Uh, now we'll continue on talking about what is uh, on the docket for Oklahoma City against Orlando. Paint points. Orlando actually won paint points fifty to forty six. They used Wendell Carter Jr. as a very aggressive roller, which was uh, good for them. Uh, the, the, of course, they won second chance points twelve to seven. Fast break points went to Oklahoma City's way fifteen to nine, but it wasn't a massive disparity. Disparity, despite Orlando turning the ball over five more times than Oklahoma City did. Uh, the, the Magic, you could not hit cash in from three. They shot 30% from beyond the arc. Only shot 45% from the floor. The Thunder shot 40% from three, plus 10 there, and 54% from the floor overall. Thunder made 91% of their free throws. Magic only made 80% of their free throws. The Thunder were out-rebounded 48-31, to 31, but they did, again, win the turnover battle in this game. They just had 
you know, the two best players. Whenever you have the two best players, you're typically going to win. Uh, I think that they did a great job of handling the the initial punch, which was a punch from both the Magic themselves. I mean, Jalen Suggs finishes with 17 points, um, and, and he was lighting it up for a, a good long minute there from beyond the arc. But a punch from the crowd, which was very raucous. I mean, this was a big deal for Orlando. It was, it was the Shaq jersey retirement, first jersey retirement in franchise history. It was uh, the first national TV game at home since uh, like 20, whatever, 16 it was or whatever. Uh, it's it, by and large the first you know playoff game at home since um, Paulo Banquero has been in the NBA. His first time ever playing on national TV was on in this game as well. And he played well, 23 points on 60% scoring from the floor. You know, this meant, meant a lot to Orlando, but the Thunder handled th- that best punch that Orlando gave them and settled into the game very nicely uh, and made the necessary adjustments as we've talked about uh, throughout this game. I think that Usman Jang played well in this one. Uh, he, he's been playing well here of late, and he's been playing well in small doses as like a, as like a punchy player. Look, say what you want. I, and I think that what happens with Usman Jang is that you look around at J-Dub, you look around at Kaysen, you look around at Chet, you look around at all these youngsters who have been really good in the NBA from the moment they've stepped foot on the hardware, on the hardwood. They have the hardware right now with the lockdown title belt. And you forget that that's an anomaly. That's not supposed to be what happens. You're not supposed to be a, a, a product like that, your first 50 games in the NBA. And for Usman Jang, the Thunder drafted him understanding he would be a project player, understanding he would take time, and independent of how fast this rebuild's gone, independent of how uh, quickly this team has turned the corner, that's still true. It doesn't have to be this comparison between, you know, the rest of the young core and Usman Jang. He was never supposed to be on their trajectory. He was never supposed to be on their on their same developmental plan. But you look at him as as a isolated prospect. What have the Thunder asked him to do? They've asked him to get more, you know, aggressive and more, you know, offensive force, as as Kim Wood says and Mark says, and this organization says for Usman Jang. He's by far and away done that. You know, he leads. You know, he has a career high in in dunks in the G League, and he and he had that. You know, his first like twenty games this season. Uh, you know, he's been way more aggressive at the rim. He's been way more aggressive getting his own shot in the G. Things where he was, you know, last year in the G League, he was not doing that. Last year in the G League, it was much of the same from his NBA time. So you didn't really miss much. Uh, he was kind of floating around more and, and still not being uh, you know, as aggressive as he should have been in the G. This year, it's completely different. He, he's playing with offensive force. He's playing more aggressive at both levels. Uh, and he's finding ways to impact the game and mix it up on both ends, especially at the rim. The second thing that they've asked him to do, and this is from Cam Wood specifically, you know, he, he told me that I asked him, you know, what are you looking for from Usman Jang? Like, what's his big assignment this year? As last year was playing with offensive force, and Usman's big assignment this year has been to, even though you're you know one of the best blue players, and even though you're going to be a starter, they're going to take him in and out of games, kind of at the rate he would in Oklahoma City for the Thunder. So. Play, you know, not using your first two or three minutes of game action to get ready and get accustomed to the game. Be present and be kind of impactful the second you step on the floor because you're only going to get you know, a fine chunk to do so at the NBA level. So to give you this long leash of just like straight 20 minutes of runtime would not be ideal for development. And they, so they've done a great job of, in the blue of trying to replicate these short bursts of minutes where he needs to be impactful, even in the G League with the NBA. And that's exactly what's happened. He's only, he only played nine minutes in this game for Oklahoma City. But in those nine minutes, he got four assists. He got a rebound. He got a steal. He played active defense. And he took two threes without hesitation, which you're going to like to see. So he's done everything and, and has accomplished you know what they've been asking him to accomplish and develop into. And he's been continuously getting better. The only thing you're looking for from Usain Jang from this point forward is that three-point shot to hit. Because it's not hitting in the G League either. He's shooting like 28% on catch and shoot threes in the G. Uh, you know, of course, he has not shot the ball overly well at the NBA level, although, uh, you know, over two tonight. But still, the process of those shots are better because they're not hesitant. They don't have a hitch to allow the defense to uh, adjust. So he's gotten better at the process. Now you need the results to catch up from beyond the arc for Oost. But once those results from three catch up, I think it'll be easier and easier to see the picture and see, um, you know, how much better. Oos has gotten from year to year. I think he can get lost and buried in from what everyone else has done. 
which is a little unfair to him, especially whenever you take a step back and remember he was never supposed to be an instant mac microwave success. He was supposed to take time, and he is taking time. And he uh, you know, is taking time, though, going in the right direction, going forward, which is what you want to see from a guy like Usman Jang. So this is another show recapping the Magic game. We're going to have Michael Martin on Thursday. Where we we, there was a great conversation, honestly, uh, where we talked about you know, playoff matchups that we liked and, and don't like for this team. We talked about playoff rotations and what that would look like and who should play, who shouldn't play. And uh, also got into what to watch for in the second half of this season. We're going to have a mailbag podcast on Friday. So check that out. And of course, we're going to be in Indy for All-Star Weekend. So who knows what will pop up uh, from Lockdown Thunder on shorts on YouTube and also full podcast around a lot of cool people in Indy. So subscribe for free across all podcasting platforms so you never miss an episode, including on YouTube. Check us out today. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe for free. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore styles and check out inside the thunder.com. And until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.